All right, hello everyone. All right. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, welcome everyone online and here in the room to this SSN seminar with the wonderful Marsha Inhorn visiting us from Yale. My name is Karina Traits. I'm the coordinator of the SSN. So normally I'm not over here, I'm down there uh, managing the admin. Uh, but I'm also an anthropologist uh, who works on personhood, ARTs, nourishment, and kinship. And for those reasons, I'm obviously delighted to welcome Marsha Inhorn to NAM in Melbourne, as well as our wonderful friend of the SSN, Nirvatia, who will be our discussion today. A bit about the Science and Society Network. Um, it was formed in 2018 in recognition that scientists and humanities and social science researchers need to work together to meet the great challenges of the century. The Science and Society Network supports early and mid-career researchers across Deakin who are embarking on groundbreaking interdisciplinary projects and through seminars such as this aims to connect new diverse people to new diverse ideas and directions. I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we are today, those of us in this room, which is the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin nations. I would like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging, particularly as a South African visitor to this land. Uh, so for those of us who have not attended an SSN seminar to date, um, I'll begin by uh, introducing our speaker, uh, who will then have around about 45 minutes to speak about her wonderful book. Um, and then I'll introduce Nira Bhatia, who uh, is the discussant. And then we'll have questions, uh, a Q&A session from the audience. Those of you who are online, please be welcome to join in on the chat, to introduce yourselves and to make yourself comfortable in that space. And any questions that you post in the chat will be passed on to Marsha from Radhika and myself. So we'd yeah, really like to hear from you and engage with you online and in the room. So without further ado, uh, Professor Marsha C. Inhorn is the William K. Landman Jr. Professor of Anthropology and International Affairs at Yale University. She is a specialist on Middle Eastern gender and health issues and has conducted research on the social impact of infertility and assisted reproductive technologies in Egypt, Len uh, Lebanon, the United Arab Emirates and Arab America over the past 35 years. She's published six books in this field and it's really wonderful today to see the seventh book um, deal specifically with the American Leighton Gap. Marsha's previous books have won numerous prestigious awards, including the Society for Medical Anthropology's Eileen Basker Prize and the AAA's Diana Forsyth Prize for Outstanding Feminist Anthropological, Anthropological Research. She has co-edited or edited over 13 further books as the co-editor of the Bergen book series on fertility, reproduction, and sexuality, Associate Editor of Global Public Health, former Co-Editor-in-Chief of Reproductive Biomedicine and Society Online, and founding editor of the Journal of Middle East Women's Studies, of the Association of Middle East Women's Studies. Her numerous other incredible achievements and interests um, and her work with students is listed on her website and Yale staff bio, which I recommend you to visit. Um, so with great pleasure, I welcome up Marsha. <laughs> Thank you so much. We're just letting, so what will happen for the online viewers is that you'll jump to the slides now. So I just wanted to let everyone online see you in person before we do the slides. There we go. And there we go. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Green. Well, thank you, everybody, for being here and for people being here online, too. Um, I really want to thank Karina, Radhika, and Nira for being the coordinators of this particular event. And just that it's wonderful that you have the uh, you know, SSNN network. Uh, we have no such thing at Yale University. And I believe STS couldn't be more important um, you know, in terms of an area of scholarship and contemporary relevance in society. So it's wonderful that you come together 
in this interdisciplinary format. You know, really, I, I appreciate it. And I'm so glad to be here. Yeah, so um, I am a Middle East scholar for almost my entire career. But then in the last decade, uh, I did a study, my first study that really focuses on American women's lives. And it was published last year in a book called Motherhood on Ice, The Mating Gap and Why Women Freeze Their Eggs. And it focuses on this technology, oocyte, which is egg, cryopreservation is freezing through vitrification, which is a form of flash or fast freezing at very low temperatures. And why is that technology, especially vitrification important? The human egg is large, it's the largest cell in the human body, it's watery, and older slow freezing methods of uh, cryopreservation basically made the egg crystallize, fragment, and you know, not survive. So it really took a long time for scientists, you know, embryologists to figure out how to do egg freezing. Sperm freezing had been possible for a long time, really since the 1950s, 1960s. Um, embryo freezing, the history is here in Australia. Alan Trounson, a famous reproductive scientist, was the first to freeze a human embryo very soon after the birth of the world's first IVF uh, baby, Louise Brown, born in 1978 in England. But it took till the new millennium to figure out how to successfully freeze human eggs. It's really a, a technology of the aughts, but it's really come into practice in the last decade. And just to be really clear, eggs are kind of frozen in time. So if a woman freezes her eggs at age 30, and then a decade on when she turns 40, she goes back to use the frozen eggs. They are biologically her 30 year old eggs. It preserves them at whatever quality and quantity she froze them. And we realize in assisted reproduction that although the human uterus, the womb does matter in, in pregnancy and so on, it's really egg age and quality, quality and quantity of her eggs that matter to fertility the most. Um, and you'll, you'll sort of see why I'm going to talk a little bit about fertility, age related fertility decline. So in, we've not, we're slightly over a decade of egg freezing, um, just the history of it in the US. The American Society for Reproductive Medicine, which is the large organization of IVF clinicians, um, they lifted the experimental label on egg freezing in the end of 2012 so that it could be used for both medical egg freezing for people with you know, diseases and conditions, but also for healthy, healthy women to freeze their eggs. And it was almost an immediate impact. I mean, the first year of clinical use, there were already 5,000 egg freezing cycles performed in the U.S., it more than doubled by 2018. By 2021, three years on, it had again more than doubled. And it's estimated that nearly 100,000 egg freezing cycles have now been performed in this you know, period, uh, 12 year period, 2009 to 2021 in the US. And the big boost was during COVID. <laughs> we did not lock down like Australia did, but it was a period of about two years in America where people were not going out and about. And obviously, as you'll see, for people who were single and worried about their fertility and aging, um, it was a difficult period uh, for dating and mating. And so there was a huge increase in demand in, in those years of COVID. So in terms of percentage, it's estimated at about 400% increase in egg freezing cycles during the first decade in the US. And look at Australia, even, even a bigger boost in uh, people, the demand um, for egg freezing in this country. But you know, it's a very costly and uncertain technology uh, like all assisted reproductive technologies, egg freezing is really expensive. Um, and the U.S., I should say, is the most expensive country in the world to perform any ART. But, you know, egg freezing now on average costs about $16,000. You know, it can range depending on the clinic, but that's estimated to be the average. And I calculated in Australia, apparently it is about $5,000 U.S. Dollars to do a single cycle of egg freezing which is much less in terms of, you know, US dollars. So it's much less expensive here. But then there are annual storage fees. Once you freeze your eggs, you have to pay for their storage. And the US, it can range from $500 to $1,500 annually. So if you store for 10 years at $1,500, you're talking about another $15,000 for the storage. And then it's about on average $6,000 to rewarm and fertilize the frozen eggs basically the second half of an IVF cycle. So from start to finish, it is about 30,000 US dollars. It is very expensive. Um, and um, many women have to do it more than once. Uh, you'll see from my study, a lot of women have to do multiple cycles to get this sort of 
highly valued 20 egg goal. Women are told you need about 15, but ideally about 20 frozen eggs. Um, and even if you do that, it is not a guaranteed fertility insurance policy. The language of fertility insurance has been used over and over in the marketing of egg freezing, including here in Australia. And it is really not an insurance policy. Even if you freeze your eggs, it does not guarantee that they can be rewarmed and fertilized successfully and lead to a so-called take-home baby. And I do appreciate the fact that I looked at uh, the website of IVF Australia. They're trying to put a little reality testing in by saying it is unlikely to lead a, to a pregnancy for women above age 38. And you'll see why that is. Um, I do want to emphasize that egg freezing requires just bravery, courage on the part of a woman. Um, it is very intensive. It is a month of a woman's life. It involves daily clinic visits for you know, most of the period because they're doing ultrasound scanning of your ovaries as the eggs are developing. Um, Needlework, about 20% of humans have severe needle phobia. And so a lot of women find this part very difficult because you have to do self-injection if you're by yourself of hormones, which are very expensive. They're injected usually into the belly, but at the end of the cycle, there's something called the trigger shot, which is a huge needle and it goes into the gluteal muscle and doing it on your own from behind in your buttock is difficult. Um, on the day of egg retrieval, when the eggs are removed from the ovaries, it is a transvaginal surgery. It has to be under sedation and it requires somebody to be there with you to take you home because you are coming out of sedation. And that actually for women can be difficult to find a person who can take a whole day off work to sort of be the accompanier. And then post retrieval, you know, women often feel uncomfortable, bloated, you know, not really good. And there's a potential for something called ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, which is potentially serious and life threatening, a massive accumulation of fluid in the abdomen, and it can really affect the lungs as well. And then it, let me just say in the US, it was not a patient-centered experience for most women. I have really a whole chapter in the book about the lack of patient-centeredness and increasing. For one thing is you're gonna see most of the people doing this are single, they're not married, they're not partnered. And going into an IVF clinic, it's a very married kind of space. I mean, it's for people who are couples experiencing infertility. So egg freezing women often feel kind of stigmatized, lonely, isolated, you know, just being feeling bad about being there. And then there are just problems. It's usually the clinics are very busy. You know, women said it's like being in a factory. You feel like you're on an assembly line calling out names like a cattle call. It wasn't a pleasant experience for most women. You know, for some, they said, oh, it was easy peasy. But for most women, it was not. And I have a huge list of recommendations for what would patient-centered egg freezing really look like. So at the end of the day, um, a few women said, you know, I felt like a badass going through this. So I actually said, egg freezing requires badass bravery. You know, you have to be really kind of tough to go through it, especially when you're doing it more or less on your own. And so given all that, why would women turn to egg freezing? You know, what, what's, what's the big push? And are they intentionally deferring, delaying, or, and postponing having children? Those are the three verbs used over and over in media reports and actually in a lot of scholarship that this is about intentional deferral, women deferring their childbearing, and why it's often said, oh, they're doing it for education and career planning purposes. This is about this career, ambitious career women, a term that I must say, we don't have an equivalent term for men, right? No career men. And actually the ASRM picked up this kind of notion of planning, like this is a family planning strategy that women are using because in 2018, they issued a statement, an ethical, an ethics statement saying, we think that egg freezing should be called planned oocyte prior preservation. So, you know, there's been a lot of sort of discourse, popular and scholarly discourse about egg freezing, but you know, for me it was, well, what do women themselves have to say about why they're doing it and how they think of it? And that's where I did, I mean, I'm an anthropologist like Karina. I did a big ethnographic study, qualitative study. It was funded by the US National Science Foundation in the cultural anthropology and science and society programs. Actually, NSF has got a great uh, grant portal, which is called Science and Society. It's for all the STS kind of um, applications. And I basically, a flyer was sent out. Um, I recruited women from four US IVF clinics. Two of them were academic, two of them were private, and they volunteered. I mean, they, if they were interested, they contacted me. Um, and I ended up uh, interviewing women who, I mean, almost all of the women I interviewed had already taken 
uh, undertaken at least one, uh, one egg freezing cycle. Although I did talk to a few people who were sort of beginning it or going through it or had decided not to do it. But all in all, uh, there were 150 women in my study. 36 of them were women facing medical problems. And let me just say that originally, egg freezing was about this population of women, you know, young women, often in their sometimes late teens and twenties, mostly facing cancer diagnoses. And if you go through cancer treatment, you know, chemo, radiation, and surgery, it can destroy a woman's fertility. Um, it can destroy the ovarian function. And so I did speak to 36, mostly young women with breast cancer in their twenties uh, and other kinds of cancer, blood cancers as well. But, um, the majority of women in my study were doing so-called elective or non-medical or what's often called social egg freezing. Although women that I talked to did not like the term social egg freezing. They said, this is not a social event. It's anything but social. That makes it sound so trivial as if this is a fun thing. So all in all, I talked to hundreds of hours talking to women who had done it and sort of collecting their egg freezing stories I asked a few socio-demographic questions of everybody in the beginning, and then just said, well, tell me about your egg freezing. And a lot came out. Um, and I want to share a few of those stories today in this little talk. Um, but to say my book really focuses mostly on the women doing this electively. Who are they? What's the demographic? Um, it was a racially and ethnically diverse group of women. And I want to emphasize that because there was a, a powerful editorial written in the New York Times that egg freezing was for white women only. And that is not true. Um, it's not true. It hasn't proven to be true in the US. My study, it was very diverse. I mean, it was mostly white women, more than two thirds, but there were many Asian American women actually were overrepresented. And then there were black, Latinx, mixed race, and women of Middle Eastern heritage in the study. Um, very urban population. I mean, I recruited people from IVF clinics and cities, um, but you know, about 58% or about 60% were from East Coast places. I did uh, want to talk to women in tech because there's been a lot of discussion about egg freezing in tech. And I did, you know, almost 20% in the Bay Area, Silicon Valley. And then about a quarter of the women just were from other cities around the country. And they were a very highly educated group of women, stunningly highly educated. Only 20% or one fifth of women had stopped at the bachelor's level and 80% had, you know, many degrees, postgraduate degrees, many master's degrees, MDs, JDs, PhDs, MD, PhDs. And a lot of women had like you know, JD and MPP or MPH and MSW. It was a lot of degrees. And so because they were so highly educated, these were women who were already successful professionals well into their careers. And there were sort of 10 broad fields. Um, some of them are listed here. The highest group was women in healthcare, physicians, nurses, health, public health professionals, uh, health policy makers, people in healthcare were doing egg freezing. And then I interviewed a lot of women in the Washington DC area in government, women in tech in Silicon Valley, you know, communications, law, arts, and there were professors, professors, academics for freezing their eggs. And they were people who made money. Um, you know, I didn't ask everybody about salaries, but some volunteered their salaries and they were well over six figures, high salaries, putting them in the top 10% of US earners. And why did that matter? Because it's such an expensive technology. Women were very proud that they had been able to finance it on their own. And something like 93% of women um, had done it completely on their own. They, you know, even though sometimes parents volunteered to sort of donate money. Women are like, no, I did it. I'm doing it on my own, but at great cost to themselves. They often spent down their savings. They took out low interest credit cards. They, some took out small bank loans. It wasn't always easy to pay those large sums. And then I highlight this in blue because it was a late 30 something crowd. And that's really been shown in most of the egg freezing studies around the world. A big, a big paper just came out one of the biggest clinics in New York that has done the most egg freezing just did a big review of their, their, their material all these years showing that it was even a higher average age at egg freezing. It was almost 38 years of age. Women are coming late to this technology. And in my case, in the, the age at first egg freezing for women in my study was almost 37. And why does that matter? Because of this thing colloquially known as the fertility cliff. 
Actually, Kathy Walby from ANU has written in her book, The Oocyte Economy, about this fertility cliff. I mean, what is this? Basically, women in their 20s, for the most part, have excellent fertility. You know, unless there's some specific problem, fertility is pretty good throughout the 20s for most women. At age, about age 32, it begins to drop a bit. But about age 37, there's like a very significant decline in fertility for most women. And it's been called the fertility cliff. Okay. And see, for men, it's much slower. You know, it's a different situation for men. But why does the fertility cliff matter? Oh, no, just to say, by age 40, uh, by age 40, women have less than a 5% chance of conceiving naturally. So by early 40s, most women are going to have trouble getting pregnant. And the thing is, women, you know, the question is, why are women coming so late to this new technology? Women didn't understand that age-related fertility decline. It was very surprising to me that such a highly educated group of American women felt that they were in the dark about their fertility. I, I called it fertility benightedness and try to sort of explore why, you know, women had certain explanations. Like I never knew, I really never knew why we have really not good sex education in American schools. It, it isn't even available in most, in many states in the American South. And it's, if it is, it's abstinence only education. You know, so you may or may not get sex education. And if you do, it's going to be about prevention of pregnancy, prevention of pregnancy, prevention of STIs and use of contraception. Women said, we never talked about if you wanted to get pregnant, what do you need to be thinking about in terms of age? So that was one issue. Another one is that their regular gynecologist never spoke to them about age-related fertility decline. And part of that is because of feelings of sensitivity, especially when women are single and they're not partnered and, you know, they're in their thirties, like, should you bring it up? It might make a woman feel bad that she doesn't have a partner. So it's not brought up. And then the other one, which is the popular culture and the media in America about all the old celebrity moms in their, you know, late forties, early fifties, who've had babies, pregnant and babies without disclosing that absolutely they were using donor egg. You know, it, these were donor egg pregnancies, but undisclosed. So women were like, how did I end up? I'm so highly educated. I've had so much sex education. And I didn't know that if I came at age 36, I would be facing premature ovarian aging. I had no idea. And they were angry about it. So that was one big issue. But the other big issue about why women are coming too late is what I ended up calling the men as partners problem. That is actually a public health term used in a lot of reproductive health literature about men in the global South that men in the global South need to be better reproductive partners, men as partners to their, their you know, wives or, or women partners. But I think you know, we need to sort of shift the focus and say, do women in the global North have a men as partners problem if they're heterosexual? And I would say that they do. Um, most women in my study who came to egg freezing at age 36.6 on average, we're coming because they were heterosexual. I only had three women in the study who said that they were bisexual and uh, you know nobody who said that they were lesbian. So these were heterosexual women, but they were mostly single. 82% of them were single at the time of egg freezing, either because they were just single, 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 no partner, they hadn't had a partner for a while. And then there were a lot of, you know, sort of relationship traumas. There were bad divorces and broken engagements. And you know, breakups of sometimes substantial long relationships, but ended up breaking up. And of the 18% of women who were in relationships at the time they froze their eggs, you know, half of those said it was an unstable relationship. You know, either it was just new, they didn't know if it was gonna last, or it was already a rocky relationship, or it was a polyamorous relationship with a man who had multiple partners, or men who just sort of refused to like even talk about it. And even the women who felt that they were in a stable relationship when they froze their eggs, the reason they were freezing is because the male partner was unready. He was unready to become a dad at that point. So it was something about men as partners that really emerged in my study. I mean, honestly, that sociological term about theoretical saturation, like when do you know that you're seeing you know, the same answers over and over and over again? For me, it was about at interview 10, you know, the first 10, it was just such an overwhelmingly, the story was just repeated so often in the study. And so my main finding in the study is that 
egg freezing isn't being done by career women to intentionally postpone their fertility. Rather, working professional women are attempting to preserve and extend their fertility, which I believe are the two <laughs> verbs we should be using at the end of their reproductive lifespans because they cannot find a stable, committed reproductive partner, even though that is what they want. Um, and so then the next question for me was, well, why? Why are so many highly educated American professional women partnerless? And I'm gonna show you just a few stories throughout. Um, this is just a kind of typical woman from my study being single, single, single. I call her Aziza. She was an academic physician, actually, at a very elite East Coast medical school. She was super subspecialized. She had two specialties. She had had a boyfriend in medical school, but when things started going awry, he told her he was better than she was, and he dumped her, and he partnered with a nurse. And then since then, she hadn't had a boyfriend. She hadn't had a partner, and she'd been single for so many years. And she said to me, I mean, it was, she said, if I found a man, I'd move to Alaska, but most men don't want relationships. They just want to meet and date. And most women won't go out with the less educated check stand dude, but men will date a less educated woman. So I think I have about a 0.09% chance of meeting someone. And meanwhile, I was feeling like, OMG, my biological clock, it's ticking, it's ticking, it's ticking, it's ticking, you know? So even though I'm 1000% happy I did it, the egg freezing, it felt somewhat like a defeat. I felt like I gave up because I couldn't find a man. And she was, you know, I mean, it was sort of very funny. She was, you know, she was doing her, you know, she talked with humor, but also a lot of self-deprecation. She was really putting herself down um, throughout the, the conversation. And so what I found is that that wasn't unusual. Women were blaming themselves for their situation. There was a lot of self-doubt. I called, I said, women had these gender laments. So, and so the first one was like, I must have done something wrong. Then um, women talked about, well, maybe women just have higher expectations for partnership now, while men have lower commitments to the whole partnership project. And so just to say a few words about each, um, the one that you know I felt I think was most disturbing to me is women blaming themselves and putting themselves down that they had done something wrong. Um, and you know, women said, it's an eternal mystery to me. I don't know how I ended up in this situation. I, I always thought that I'd be by the age of 35 partnered with a couple of kids. I've always wanted children. I've wanted them since I was young. How did I end up like this? So then it was, oh, maybe I'm too picky. Maybe my standards are too high. I want too much. Maybe I'm too old. And this was a theme, this ageism theme that, you know, once a woman reaches her mid to late thirties, men are on the lookout like, ah, I shouldn't be with her because she'll want to have a baby right away. So like ageism coming in, women questioning their attractiveness. Aziza, for example, was one of these people like, oh, I'm ugly. You know, it's like, what? You're not ugly. Women's, you know, saying I must have done something wrong or I'm not attracted to the right man. I should have stayed with my college boyfriend. He was not who I loved, but at least he was nice. And then the final two issues about putting the energy in, putting the work in, especially to online dating, which almost everybody had undertaken. And women, you know, sometimes told me it's like torture, you know, I have a busy job and then I come home and it's like a second job. It's fruitless. It doesn't get me anywhere. And it's, it's a torturous process. Then we would talked about as a generation of like millennial Gen Z or Gen X, you know, the sort of younger generation, reproductive generation, that this generation may just have higher expectations than their parents' generations, generation. And women often talked about their parents, that most of them really admired their parents, not only their, their mothers, but their fathers, who raised them to want gender equality, you know, at work and at home. They wanted egalitarian relations with men. Um, and so maybe because of that, they said, well, maybe we're just becoming much more selective in choosing mates. And this term settling was used over and over. I don't want to settle for someone who I don't really love or settle for somebody who doesn't really understand me or settle because I'm desperate to have kids. So the term was settling. What women wanted was soulmate, somebody who loved them, understood them, supported them, you know, got them as humans. And then there are these gender norms, you know, which are unfortunately, I'm going to say worldwide. We just published an edited volume called Weighthood about, you know, that people around the world are waiting to marry, waiting to have children. But part of this is about, in anthropology, these terms hypogamy or partnering down and hypergamy, partnering up. 
and the fact that traditionally women around the world are expected to engage in hypergamy, which is find a man a little bit older, someone who's got a better job, someone who can support, be the male breadwinner, support a wife and children, uh, you know, be <coughs> have a better job, better career. So that's a sort of a gendered expectation. Whereas women are supposed to, so women are supposed to marry up. Men are not socialized. They're socialized into finding somebody slightly younger, fertile, maybe less educated. So these are retrogressive gender norms, but they seem to be around still um, because women talked about this. And if you're a high achieving woman who's already sort of at the educational top, you have a good job, you're successful, who is your equal? And who would you hypergamously mate with? You know, where do you go up? So this notion of like having narrow options, you know, there aren't that many people that you could choose in the world uh, to be your equal. So this is something I think that is interesting and important and women talked about it because they said, men are not raised like women in America. Men are not, ne not necessarily raised to want an egalitarian partnership at home. And most men are still socialized to find, to marry down hypogamously. And so what women talked about sort of over and over, it was a running theme through the study was the fact that they felt men were intimidated of them, that they, these are very successful women. And if they showed any signs of being highly educated, having a good home, you know, a good job, a good car, that when men would see that, you'd never see the men after the first date. And I had many, 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 many discussions, you know, about women, women who said, you know, I've gone on a hundred dates with men, probably none of them are as highly educated as I am. And I never, you know, there's never a second date. They, they say things like you work there. Oh, that means you're smarter than I am. So a lot of sort of misogyny in there too. And then there was this term that I had never heard to tell me the truth, but I, it started to be raised, especially in California, about the Peter Pans of the world. And that's just a way of saying, you know, men, children, the men who don't want to grow up. And they could be educated and affluent men. Um, in, in the tech world, there are a lot of men who are well educated and have money, but they will, you know, take you out, they'll have fun, they'll take you, wine and dine you but they have no intention of partnering with you and settling down with you and being with you. It's really frustrating, especially for women who had sunk time into trying to make one of these guys, you know, be with them. And then there was a discussion about divorce that this is in America, sort of the first generation whose parents were able to divorce freely and openly, you know, no fault divorce sort of came around with the second wave feminism. And if you came from a, a family where the parents were divorced, not amicably, there was this feeling that people didn't trust the marriage, marriage institution anymore. And that especially men might have been affected by this because they, they saw how their mothers had been hurt and they didn't want to hurt a woman, you know, by sort of partnering and committing to them. So these are sort of women's explanations of what they thought were, you know, going on with men. But the, the, the running theme was the unready man, men who just were unready or unwilling to become fathers, just like they would talk about it, but like not now, you know, maybe someday in the future, unreadiness was a was the theme. And this was a story in chapter two, which I call the end of romance about unreadiness. Um, uh, a woman I call Lily, she was a very successful Manhattan based art curator. She hung in for 10 years with a guy who we'll call Jack, who was always unready, still unready. And as you say, she left at the age of 40, finally, after 10 years with him, and she froze her eggs when she was in her early 40s, which was too late, and it didn't work for her. And this is what she said. He was a professor and an academic, and I don't know if that has anything particularly to do with it, but I think he just couldn't commit. And I wanted to get married and have a kid, and he just couldn't get there in the same timeline while he was getting tenure, which I don't think you have the same thing here, but it's like a big struggle to get tenure and to get a permanent position in the U.S., so he was like, I really want it. I see myself with kids playing ball. In theory, when I close my eyes, it's in the picture. But in reality, I'm totally paralyzed with fear. And so Lily says, and so, you know, I was sort of sick of clubbing the baby seal over the head. I went off the pill. He wouldn't sleep with me for 14 months. So 14 months, and then I was just over it. There comes a point where you can only take so much. And I had just not consciously just realized that. 
and just had to leave. And the sad story, the sadness of that story is that Lily was the only child of a physician father who had survived the Holocaust as a child. Her dad was a Holocaust survivor. She was his only kid. He uh, tried very hard to get her to egg freeze and he really wanted her to have a child. And I feel like you know, it didn't work out and her lineage, you know, the remaining lineage was destroyed. I, I actually blamed it on Jack in the first writing of the book. And my editor said, no, you can't, you can't blame that on Jack, but I, you know, could we blame it on Jack? I mean, he basically just kept her prolonged for such a long time. And sadly, she still loved the guy. She said, he was my soulmate. I still love him. He was the one for me, but he just wouldn't, wouldn't do the thing that she wanted. So I ended up calling this situation the mating gap, that women who are going to turn to egg freezing really want the three piece. They want to be partnered. They want to be heterosexually partnered. They want to experience physical pregnancy, ideally with their own eggs, and they want parenthood. They want to be moms. And a lot of women said, I've known this since I was a child that I want to have kids. But they lack the three E's, eligible, educated, and equal male partners and one of my colleagues said, you need to add eager and enthusiastic <laughs> because Jack just wasn't eager and enthusiastic. And she said, you know, we need to add the, the couple more ease to this list. So women are facing these four partnership problems. Just these men who say they're unready. They can't quite be ready for it. The Peter Pans and, and, and other men of the world like Jack. Men who feel very reluctant to partner with high or higher achieving women and feel intimidated. There were men who women just, you know, told about bad things that happened, misogyny, ageism, infidelity, substance use, sort of bad stories of, of men as partners. Um, and I don't want to say all men are bad people. You know, I actually, in one of the chapters of the book, toward the end, I talk about the people who support women in egg freezing, and there were a lot of men there in the support world dads, brothers, male friends, sometimes ex-partners, you know, so it's not like all men are bad, but there are men who is, exhibit bad behavior. And women said, I've encountered so many different types of men in my dating world, um, but rarely the one that I want, the unicorn. <laughs> I was like, what's a unicorn? Uh, they had many different types of men they wanted to tell me about. I have a table in chapter one of the book called the 10 types of men, women's lexicon. And these were the types, alpha males who want to be challenged by work, not their partners, beta males just floating along in life, they're portable, feminist men who, who say about partnering, I'm not old fashioned like that, <laughs> partnering is passe. Uh, oh, I love this one, foreign service men, because I interviewed a lot of women in DC, Yale, pale and male, um, <laughs> Peter Pans, the men who never want to grow up, the polyamorous men, which uh, women said it's a fetish subculture, the bane of women's existence, the men who say they want to have multiple committed relationships with women. Um, in the tech world, startup men waiting to change the world, not to mate. Tech men, this was said over and over by women in, in tech. The odds are good, but the goods are odd. And then unicorns. These are the equal men who want to marry and parent, but that pool doesn't exist. <laughs> And then younger men, some women had tried to date down age-wise to younger men, but they said younger men only know how to meet online and hook up with women. They literally don't know how to take a, a woman out on a date. So, you know, there's much more in that table than this, but this is, you know, the women told me about these kinds of men that they had met along the way. So obviously there's some kind of a gap between men and women. And, I, and the question is, is this all about traditional gender norms? and desires and different expectations and different aspirations that are emerging between men and women? Is it about gender laments and gender disparities? Oh, I think a lot of it is. Um, you know, as a feminist scholar, I can say definitely there's some problems. Uh, a, a queer theorist who wrote a book for NYU Press as well calls this the tragedy of heterosexuality. And I sort of adopted that phrase in the introduction to my book. But I also think we need to look at demography and education, which is your topic. And something that's not discussed well enough, including in the US, is that there are massively emerging gender-based educational disparities. And I think it underlies uh, women's partnerlessness. It's little discussed in the US, but basically women are rising educationally. And I think it's a cause for celebration. It's actually a worldwide phenomenon while men are losing ground educationally. And it is a cause for concern. And actually in the US, I'm gonna tell you in the last five years, 
men's sliding out of education, higher education and labor markets is a cause for concern. There are multiple, there's a MIT report called Wayward Sons. Um, there are books called The Crisis of Men and Boys. There, there are a lot of op-eds about the fact that men are not doing well. The modal man in America is not doing well educationally and uh, professionally. The minority of men are succeeding in the current generation, but most are not. And here's the statistics. American women have been graduating from university in greater numbers for years, actually since the 1990s, when there were certain policies to try to get women into education and into sports in America. Title IX and, uh, you know, to try to help women achieve uh, education. So by 2015, there were four university graduated women for every three men, a 43 ratio. Uh, 2019, before COVID, it was estimated that there were 28% more American women in than men in higher education at the time. In 2021, there was a massive slide out of, call, of university admissions, but 71% of the decline was attributable to men. Men were sliding out much more than women. And this year, it's estimated that the number has increased from 28% to 38%, that there will be 38% more female graduates from university than male graduates. So soon, I mean, they say it's in the next 10 years, there will be two university-educated American women for every one university-educated American man. That is a two-to-one ratio. And what does that mean for women in the prime reproductive years from 22 to 39, you know, 20s and 30s? There are millions, millions more university educated women than university educated men. And so if a woman wants an equal partner in terms of somebody with a university education, there is, are simply not enough of them. And this was spelled out very clearly by economic journalist John Berger in a book that came out in 2015 called Datanomics, How Dating Became a Lopsided Numbers Game. He, he just used US census data to show, to show the story. And the story is what he called a university educated man deficit and an oversupply of educated women, which he called a demographic time bomb for marriage minded heterosexual women. And he said, what happens, the datanomics part of it is that you've got uh, this minority of educated men and a huge supply of educated women. And so on dating apps and so forth, the educated men are desired by you know, most of the educated women and they have just so many women to choose from. It creates a lopsided dating pool where men can play the field and they can delay and have fun and have relationships with multiple women. They have no incentive basically to really partner with one person and, you know, and stay the course. And so highly educated women at the top, sort of like the women in my study are in trouble if they want to marry and mate and, you know, have kids. We know from tons of sociological research in the U.S. that men at the bottom of the economic sort of ladder in the U.S., blue collar or, you know, working for men are in trouble. Uh, we know that most of them cannot support themselves, let alone a partner and children. And more and more uh, men are living at home, you know, well into their 40s and 50s with parents because they can't support themselves. So we've got some real issues in the United States on education and labor. And same problem in Europe. Um, if you look at the percentages, you know, I highlight the United Kingdom because it's almost exactly the same as the U.S., 27% more women in higher education. And these numbers come from the World Bank has something called the Gender Parity Index, where you can get these percentages. And so there you have it, Europe, Scandinavia, which I think we consider the most gender egalitarian part of the world. It's the same problem, very pronounced. I mean, Denmark is exactly at the level of the US, UK, Canada. And then look at like Iceland and Norway and Sweden, um, you know, really, really high numbers of women. I mean, I have colleagues in Norway who say, you know, medical school admissions now in Norway, it's, you know, overwhelmingly women going into medical school in, in their country. Um, and then here, Asia Pacific, I highlight Australia. It's, it's almost exactly the same as the US, UK, Canada, Denmark, and New Zealand, and even higher disparity. And you look at China, I emphasize China because it's such a huge country. It's got something like 1.6 billion people. And this problem has been named in China, the leftover women issue in China. So this uh, a scholar, Roseanne Lake wrote this book and she says, the women shaping the world's next superpower with the one child policy when, when parents had a daughter, 
they often super invested in her to become highly educated and successful. And so now you've got millions of these very educated Chinese women who are shaping the world's next superpower, but they've been called leftover women in scholarship and in movies and in books because they're partnerless. They have trouble in the marriage market. In fact, women with PhDs in China have been called the third gender because they're not, they don't seem like women. They don't seem like men. They don't appeal to men for marriage. They're like this anomalous third gender. So it's being discussed in a very painful way. There's some movies about leftover women in China. In the US, um, an, another journalist named Melanie Notkin wrote a very poignant book uh, called Otherhood. Um, she said, we're a generation of women right before egg freezing, before egg freezing happened. We wanted to become mothers, but we found ourselves others in a state of otherhood because we couldn't find a partner even though we wanted one. And she said, the best we can be is savvy aunties. We should be like, you know, co-parents with our nieces and nephews. And for her, uh, she's Jewish American woman and Jews represent about 2.2% of American society. And she talked about the fact that many Jews marry outside. So if you really wanted to find an equal man, a Jewish man, so many men don't marry Jewish women. So she talked about that issue too. And just, you know, ending up and Jewish women, and Asian American women are the most educated women in the United States. They're like more educated than anybody in terms of percentages. And guess what? They're overrepresented in egg freezing. Many, many Jewish women and Asian American women are freezing their eggs. So just to recap the situation, um, you've got educated women, not only in the US, but now many countries wanting to have biogenetically related offspring. They want partnership, pregnancy, and parenthood. They're unable to find heterosexual, eligible, educated, equal, enthusiastic male partners. They're facing age-related fertility decline, the fertility cliff. And so at the edge of that fertility cliff, you've got these women now turning to egg freezing because they're waiting for a mate. And I'm gonna say that mate may or may not materialize. So it's a, we don't know, it's a, it's a, it's an iffy proposition. And the, you know, you can see in this stunning statistic that about 50% of US women between the ages of 20 and 44 do not have biological children. So, you know, there are many people now are single in the United States in their reproductive years and not having kids. And so you know, what does egg freezing do? It sort of preserves and extends fertility for women during what I'm calling the reproductive waithood period where they're waiting, they're hoping to find a mate. But the mating gap and reproductive weighthood are not something women can control. This is not an individual woman's problem. This is a major societal problem. And basically, a technology cannot fix social problems. Um, I feel like egg freezing, I've called it a costly technological concession or a stopgap stop gap technological fix to a problem or a series of problems that are increasingly global in nature. And one of my interlocutors in my study said, we, we, we need to fix men. She said, it's a problem with men, we need to fix them. I mean, I don't think that this is necessarily about fixing men as if men are broken. I mean, I think we need to talk about education and why men are not getting educated, but we need as scholars, especially in the whole realm of reproductive studies to understand men's perspectives. We don't know how they feel about education, partnership, reproduction, marriage, becoming dads. There's a wealth of research on in the anthropology and sociology of reproduction, and it almost always focuses on women. I mean, including in this particular study, I didn't talk to a single man, and somebody really needs to be talking to men. There are a few studies emerging um, uh, about talking to, there's a study by an, an anthropologist named Pierre Min. He's in Quebec, in Canada. He's doing a study of young Quebecois men who say they never want to have children. And he wants to know why. How can you make that statement when you're in your 20s? So we need scholarship on men. I don't want to say it's a totally grim picture because at the end of the day, egg freezing does work for some women who use it, perhaps while they rethink mating, okay? And this term, mixed color mating, was used by John Berger in his book, Datanomics. And I picked it up for my own study. And this is a, an example of a woman I call Hannah. She was an Ivy League educated lawyer. She had an elite education. She froze, she quit her job. She froze 32 eggs. Then she went on a four month bike tour, transcontinental bike tour, where she met a 
Western firefighter who I call Lucas. Um, he, they got back. He was on one side of the country. She was on the other. He moved himself and his puppy moved in with Hannah. And I, you know, I followed them and I can say, I followed them recently had a conversation. They're 10 years into their relationship. They have two kids, including the second one was the frozen egg baby. And she was so enthusiastic about egg freezing. She called it wildly and weirdly empowering. My net only experience was it's so emotionally empowering, right? Because I went from a state of sort of panic that I was probably like in denial of and trying desperately not to have to all of a sudden I'm in control of the situation. I had had a lot of time as I went through both the egg freezing, everything associated with it and the training for the trip to really reflect on what I wanted and who I was and what I was looking for. I think having the space and the time on this bike trip to really get to know who someone was, was a real privilege. And then she said, he's a sort of extraordinarily patient and generous and brave man. And it was just easy then to sort of trust him. And it was really quite special. It was really neat. He's a good guy. He's a really good guy. I mean, she fell in love with a man who was at a different educational level. And she told me, and she had a lot to say about this. The one thing she had to get over, the obstacle for her was how she was going to introduce this man to her highly educated Harvard, Yale, Princeton friend group. They were all lawyers. And she was fearful that they were going to look down on him and her for being in a relationship. And she was happy to report that they all loved Lucas, that it, you know when they met him, they loved him. They thought he was great and great for Hannah. So it was her own sort of, you know, her own obstacles about this hypergamy, hypogamy kind of thing. So what benefits? I mean, she talked about feeling in control and so forth. Women, more than 90% of women in my study had at least one thing positive to say about their egg freezing experience. And a lot of women had multiple positive things to say. So there were like 11 categories, which I kind of summarized, that women felt that they had more choices and options once they froze their eggs. It gave them a little control over an otherwise uncontrollable situation that had helped with their decision making. The term empowerment, power, empowering was used over and over. Women felt empowered by the technology. Unfortunately, the, the term insurance was used over and over. Oh, I had some insurance, some fertility insurance. I have eggs in the bank now. It's my safety net. And we were trying not to, you know, it, I don't think that's a good term, insurance, because it doesn't always work. Women felt that they did everything in their power at the time with the resources they had, it would prevent future regret, that they did what they could at the time. And if it didn't work out, so be it, but that they had tried everything, profound psychological relief. Women said it was like pressure just being lifted off their shoulders. It gave them more time not to feel panicked about meeting somebody. It helped their dating lives. And it was a sense, a lot of women said, it was something I did for myself. I felt like I invested in myself when I was feeling bad about things. It was self-investment. It gave me a sense of success. It's a technology of optimism and hope, a hope technology to use Sarah Franklin's term. And ultimately it extended my timing. It gave me some more time for this reproductive thing. But there are so many ongoing questions. And just to wrap up here, what are some of the big questions? How many frozen eggs are good enough? I mean, women are told you need at least 15 to 20, ideally 20. But we now know for women who are older, where egg quantity and quality is going to be less, probably they need many more eggs than 20 to be successful in using them. No women return to use their frozen eggs. There was just a big study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in the U.S. Only 2.5 to 3% of women who froze their eggs have come back for them. And what do we know about that? Uh, there was a great study published in Australia by Karen Hammerberg and her colleagues. Uh, they showed that the low rates of return, globally, it's less than 12% of women are returning for the eggs. It's because they did not find a partner and can't see themselves being a parent on their own. We can talk about single motherhood by choice. I talked to everybody about that and I'm happy to say more. Will it lead to future children? Well, for some people it does. And I have several stories in my book of women who did it by themselves without a partner, women like Hannah who partnered, but they did end up with frozen egg babies. Um, will egg freezing normalize over time? It, it, it is normalizing in the US. Uh, there was taboo stigma feelings in the beginning that's shifted. You know, women are reading about it. It's advertised to them. Often like one woman in a friend group will do it. And then her other friends follow. They kind of have a community together. 
So egg freezing is now known. Um, in this decade, it's become much more uh, of a known technology. Will younger women freeze their eggs? Uh, we know that the demand for egg freezing is, is, is decreasing in age. There are many more women less than age 35 asking for it. And clinics, the very commercial clinics are really pressuring, uh, sending messages to women in their 20s to freeze their eggs, which I say is not a good strategy. I actually, in the end of my book, say women in their 20s should not be freezing their eggs. They will never use those eggs. It's not a good proposition. Will insurance cover egg freezing? Another huge issue I cover in the book, but in America, we don't have universal health care. You get your health insurance through your employer. And there are now about 40% of big companies in the United States that are offering egg freezing fertility benefits to women. It started out in tech with like mm -hmm. Google, Apple, Facebook, but it's increasing over time. And women in Silicon Valley really fought for this. And I'm happy to tell that story if you're interested. But it's not just that like companies are trying to pressure women, pressurize women to not have kids and work for 10 more years. Women fought for it because they felt it was very unfair and discriminatory towards single women not to have fertility benefits. The only country in the world that has public coverage of egg freezing that I know of is France, but it is very restricted to women under age 37 and it's a free freeze and share arrangement you freeze your eggs, but then you have to share with other women because they have a donor egg shortage in France. So it's seen as a sort of solution to that problem. It, is it globalizing? Absolutely. In 2019, the big International Federation of Fertility Society studies show that at least 60 nations were performing egg freezing regularly. You know, any place there's IVF, they're beginning to do, to do egg freezing. And this term, you know, I, I talk to the media a lot these days about it, and they go, do you think egg freezing is as revolutionary as the birth control pill? I've been asked that. And actually, the name of my NSF grant proposal was egg freezing, a reproductive revolution, question mark, because since the beginning, it's been talked about, oh, it's going to be like the pill. No, it's not. <laughs> it's way too expensive. It's never going to be like the pill unless something dramatic happens to the cost of this technology, which I don't think it will. And so my predictions are, is it a reproductive revolution? It is not. It is a very elite technology for an elite group of people in the world. Most women can never afford it. And so no, at the present time, I don't believe we can talk about it in those terms. In the future, if something really happened to bring the price down or make this technology much more accessible, maybe, and really only time will tell, and I should say that one of the last questions I asked women, well, one was, now that you've done it, how do you feel? And the other one was, do you have any recommendations? And the big recommendation across the board was something needs to be done to the cost to bring this technology, to make it more accessible because it's so inaccessible to my sister, my friend, my cousin. You know, I know people who can't begin to afford this technology. It needs to be made more accessible. And it's becoming accessible in the media. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I watched this new movie. It's called Scrambled. Um, it's actually quite good. It uh, sort of shows you the process of egg freezing, and it's really about partnership problems. Have you seen the movie? It's, it's pretty funny. It's a, it's a tragic comedy. That's what I'm going to say. It's pretty funny, but it's a tragic comedy. Uh, and so I will stop there. Thank you so much. Happy to. I will move away. Oh, I'll read about you back in a second. Okay. But we'll have Nero first to um, come and do some comments. Um, so please take a seat. Um, well, thank you for that wonderful and fascinating walk through. And and I and I will say that for those who you know haven't been able to read the book, that this is just a teaser of the incredible, rich data and the wonderful stories that are shared in the book. So it's really wonderful to have this sort of unpacked and it's, yeah, I think a really good teaser for what people can expect. Not teaser, like introduction. So I'm really pleased now to welcome Dr. Nira Vatia, who's an associate professor at Deakin Law School. Nira is the author of Critically Impaired Infants and End of Decision Life Making, Resource Allocation and Critical Decisions. She's published really widely on issues in health law and bioethics and works a lot on end of life decision making, organ donation, voluntary assistance dying, particularly ill infants and children, and increasingly on emerging health and reproductive technologies. 
Um, Nira is currently the deputy chair of the Deakin, uh, Human, Deakin University Human Ethics Research Ethics Committee and the chair of the Faculty Ethics Committee. So really thinks a lot with ethics, which is part of why we invite her, but also because she is our wonderful former SSN Healthy Future Stream Leader and the former Deputy Convener of the SSN, making her our trusted friend with many excellent insights. Thanks, Nira. Thank you. Thanks, Corinna, and thank you, Marsha. That was um, very, very insightful and very interesting. And as she was speaking, a lot of this um, reminded me of my own egg freezing experiences. So, uh, yeah, very, a very close to home um, topic, and also one that I am academically very close to too. Um, so a few comments and then a, a, a few questions. And I think th the first comments will be related broadly to the, the, the issue of, of egg freezing, which you quite rightly raised. And that is, I think, egg freezing in itself um, is more of a, a, a possibility than a probability. But unfortunately, I think it's sold as a probability. And I think there's a lot of work that needs to happen around um uh, awareness around that and in particular I speak today from an Australian perspective um, and that is that it's becoming far more commercialized we have uh, egg freezing parties that people can attend um, where you know you're, you're given a glass of champagne and sp spoken to about you know um, parting with ten thousand dollars to to freeze your eggs for some time in the future and I think that there is some level of sub, some level of unconscionability to that type of egg freezing marketing that we see we see here. Linked to that is the actual cost of IVF, which for many people is linked to egg freezing, particularly from a non uh, heteronormative experience. Um, that you know you freeze your eggs for later use for for IVF, and particularly even for older heterosexual women, um, if they have a partner or find a male partner and they still can't have a, have a child, they, they might turn to IVF or ART treatments. That is, again, um, often extremely expensive and inaccessible. And I think that goes with egg freezing. As you mentioned, it is, um, it's an expensive type of technology and it's not one that um, women um, can particularly just uh, access at whim. And I think that's something that um, that you highlighted very, very well. Um, to your point about reproductive revolution, I think that's a term that I've read many times. And again, I think it's often used, um, just, just thrown into things. And I think it's because it just sounds nice and it sounds alliterative, so we use it. And it just, it's just not the case um, in any way, shape, or form. Um, and to your point as well, I think it's it's a double-edged sword in relation to to your work. I think. Here, women are facing problems or potential problems twofold. The first is around egg freezing and the fact that it it may or may not um, be possible in terms of a numbers game. As you talk about, the older women become, the harder it is to uh, gain quality and quantity of eggs. And we know um, it becomes a, a game of uh, uh, elimination. You know, you might get... 20 eggs of which only five are of good quality, et cetera, et cetera. So you have an issue with, with egg freezing and that being not guaranteed and it's not a particularly um, a proven science. And it's it's blows my mind to this day that only sort of 40 years ago we were talking about the first IVF or ART baby and it's we talk about it as a technology, yet... We have other types of health technologies that have advanced so quickly and so rapidly in a 40-year period, yet when we think about egg freezing or reproductive technologies, they're yet so, so in some sense, so much still in their infancy. And I think egg freezing is one of those types of technologies where we can, you know, you as you said, you go through uh, rigorous types of treatment and, and hormone injections, et cetera, but there's nothing that we can say that is guaranteed that the quality of those eggs will remain as as we as we hope they will when they when they're extracted from from your body. And I think to add to that, 
to your book and to your comments, the double-edged sword here is women that are freezing their eggs with no guarantee that those eggs and the quality of those eggs will be perfect or that they will eventually lead to um, a, a viable pregnancy in a child. To add to that is finding the partner. And that is, I think, where we find this double-edged sword in relation to, to your work. And we're in, in this particular cohort, focusing on, on heterosexual women that are looking to be partnered, is to find that partner. Um, of course, my staunch feminist in me was sitting there and going, a man is not a plan, and you should be able to go and, you know, freeze your eggs and go out uh, about and, and have a, a, a child by yourself. And to your point, I know you touched on it, um, there's a huge drive in Australia for um, uh, solo mothers by choice, which again, you alluded to uh, and can talk about, uh, I'm sure at some point. Um, the last comment I wanted to make, which you touched on again, is around egg disposition. And I think that's um, an issue that probably needs further discussion. And that is again, linked to, you know, women going through really rigorous um, forms of treatment, hormone injections, et cetera, the chance of en ending up with, um, you know, um, OHS and, and, and hyperstimulation, um, and then having these eggs sitting in, in banks that aren't, aren't used and, and this surplus of eggs, which again is something I'm looking at at the moment and that idea of, well, what happens to those? And we have a huge egg shortage and sperm shortage here in Australia. And what, what could we do in, in those situations with that um, surplus um, use of eggs? Could they be used for research or could they be donated to, to other, um, other, other women? You talked about the cost of, of treatment. And again, that's something that um, is an issue here in, in Australia. I know it's, you mentioned it's um, far more costly in America, but here, particularly for, for IVF, um, women and couples even end up um, accessing their superannuation or their, their pension funds to, to access um, their funds for this type of treatment. So I guess the psychological and mental um, uh, impact it has from just a, a female perspective on your body, on, on your mind, but also then adding to that the weight of finding a, a mating partner or a partner to then have a child and, and have a family with is then, you know, exacerbated to, to your point. Um, I'd be interested in your comments from your study. You said there were a number of women in healthcare and tech that were part of that study, and I'd be interested if that was... Um, just the way it came about or if those particular cohort of women were interested because they knew more about the technology, they knew more about egg freezing, they knew more about um, the outcomes and the possible outcomes in terms of from a reproductive sense, I'd be um, interested to, to know your thoughts. And my final, my final thoughts are going to your concluding comments, she says, you know, we need to rethink um, and I, I think I think you're right in the sense of I think the focus needs to move somewhat away from women for the context of of your work and and rethink men and rethink yeah what 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 are the motivating factors for for men in relation to partnering or or wanting a family are they interested in things such as a, a legacy or um, a continuation of of, of family. Um, uh, and and what what are those types of uh, contributing factors and motivating factors for men? Um, and beyond that, I think there needs to be a fundamental rethink of reproduction. Um, what are the things that are are driving men and women to want to have children? And the technologies that are available. And to your point, which I agree with, is there needs to be a fundamental rethink of access to that type of reproduction um, and techniques and technologies, such as egg freezing, and broader than that, um, access to IVF and other types of technologies. Um, I've, I'm partway through your book. I have the rest of it on my iPad in my bag, which I'll read on my way home. But it's been an absolute joy. So thank you. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Nero, for that uh, really provocative response. So what we're going to do now is uh, um, just take a moment to pause. And this is very much in the tradition of our former coordinator, coordinator Tao Fan, who takes it from Eve Tuck, which is just to pause. We're going to reset the room. I'm sure Marshall will appreciate some time to think through those comments. And maybe everyone else would just like to chat and have a break for two minutes. And then we'll reset for the three of us to sit here so that Marsha can respond to Nira and then we'll take some, some questions from the room and also from, from online. So we'll be we'll be checking in again in two minutes. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. It was an excellent question. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's true. Now it's just uh, I'm just going to use this to check on the camera angle. And then for the long term, we don't know, you know. I mean, I'm going to say. That's right, you know. So it's like a lot of people go here. Purchase the procedures and it's better to down the return. Yeah, there was a study that showed that 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 there was a study that as, as they go into it, mm, I'm just stepping up to see it. Even in you know, this is what I'm trusting. I didn't hear them. I don't think you had to do it. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's like you're going to let me a little bit more because I'm sure you have to do treatment. But minimally, yeah. yeah. So yeah. this could be like just a minimal thing, yeah. like, oh, you're supposed to. Yeah, I'm just like, <laughs> yeah. sorry. I'll do that. 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 I'll do that
uh, and the anthro, you know, they co-funded me. I had no idea what I was going to find. And my, my primary hypothesis that I put in the grant proposal is that it was going to have something to do with educational career planning, because that's what all the literature was sort of saying. And I, but I, I kept over in the alternative hypothesis, well, it could be something else, right? It could be some other reason. And I didn't know that it was going to be about this partner problem, this partnerless issue, the, the issue of partnerlessness, which I ended up calling the meeting gap. That was just not the finding that I necessarily thought I was going to get. But it was such an overwhelming finding. And if you look at studies that have been conducted in the UK, Korea, Turkey, Australia, you know, it is repeated around the world. It's often called lack of a partner. That's the way it's often presented, lack of a partner. So obviously this is a huge issue that isn't technology related per se, but it's a social issue that is linked to the use of this reproductive technology. And so I guess that was the main thing I, I think I went in my book to sort of say, this is about women who find themselves in a difficult situation of heterosexuality is not working for them. And, you know, does the technology solve the problem? No, it doesn't. It can't solve the problem. And I think a lot of feminist scholars have been saying technologies do not solve social problems. They don't solve work-life balance issues. They don't solve, you know, uh, uh, relationship issues. So let's emphasize that. Um, but, you know, they do, this technology does work for some people. There were some women in my study, I followed up with them. They did find a partner. And like Hannah, she did have an increasing egg, as she called it, her frozen egg baby son, you know. So anyway, I, I do want to say that it was not what I was expecting, this whole issue of what I call the mating gap in the end. Now, for women who realized that finding a partner was going to be very difficult, they hadn't had any luck for you know, most of 20 years. They were thinking about what you call your solo mother by choice in America. It's called the sing single motherhood by choice or SMC. Yeah. And there is, this is an increasing social phenomenon. It's an increasing family form where women are, women are just doing it on their own. And um, it's growing around the world. I mean, in parts of the world where it is socially acceptable to do that, we're going to see more and more women who aren't partnered and just have decided to have the child on their own using technology. And we know already, I have a wonderful colleague at Wellesley College in America, her name's Rosanna Hertz, and she's she studied um, SMC, Single Motherhood by Choice. Her first book was called Single by Chance, Mother by Choice. Um, and to say that this, honestly, is, it should be single by circumstance because a lot of women, you know, it was circumstantial. They found themselves single, but are having kids. Um, and so she did a big study of those moms who made the decision. Um, but then she did a follow-up study of now these moms who've used the same anonymous sperm donor, they're going back and finding the other moms who use that sperm donor and they're connecting so that their children can know they have siblings. And so this is yet another new social reality emerging and probably in Australia, it's emerging in America where she, her second book is called Random Families, you know, that people who they're just connected by their sperm donor. And so they're, you know, they, go on summer vacations together and so forth. So Rosanna's been studying the sort of new, new kinship forms. And I do think that that's what these technologies are doing. They're creating new kinship forms. We know that uh, these technologies, ARTs, are creating queer families. I mean, this is a you know, growing social phenomenon around the world. And there's a, a, a scholar, Jaina, or, yeah, mm -hmm. who has a book called Making Gaities. Yeah, just yeah. has come out. And there are a few other books, and you know we have a we're, we're we have a big edited volume called the New Reproductive Order that's coming out. Sarah Franklin and I, and we have several of the chapters are about queer family making, you know, for men using surrogates and for women using a variety of reproductive technologies. And so that is a new part of the New Reproductive Order. Um, so the whole issue of single mother or solo mothers, I talked to almost everyone about it. Um, and some had done it. There, I pictures the stories of several women, women who had done it. Um, some were thinking about it, but the issue, and I think it's an issue in Australia too, it's very expensive to live in Melbourne or yeah. Sydney as a single woman or in New York or Washington, D.C. Yeah. or San Francisco. These are among the most expensive cities in the world. And women said, I don't know if I can swim. You know, I don't know if I can pay for childcare, daycare, I don't know if I have a support system here. My parents live in Texas. I'm here. 
I don't know if I can do it. So they were thinking through the pragmatics and the finances and sometimes deciding that it was an impossibility, okay? And uh, the women who were contemplating it and making the moves were literally physically moving often back to be near their parents or like their brothers and sisters, you know? So um, it was a plan B that I think almost everybody contemplated but came to different decisions about it. Um, and there was a great study by Karin Hammerberg and colleagues at Monash done, it was published in 2018, uh, assessing a uh, big clinic here, all of the egg freezing women who had frozen their eggs. They did a, a survey, a questionnaire of them after the bath and said, why did most of them didn't go back for the eggs? And it was almost always because they had always hoped to partner and parent and they just felt that they couldn't uh, couldn't afford it, couldn't do it, you know? So that is another inaccessibility issue, like not being able to parent because you can't afford it to do it on your own, you know, or do it in the way you feel comfortable. So that's a huge issue. Egg disposition, thank you for bringing that up. In the United States, what I learned through the study is that all clinics in the U.S. have made up their own cutoff points. Um, women are given many consent forms to sign off on, and on egg disposition, um, you are given a consent form that says, what do you plan to do with your eggs? And you have three choices, donate to others. And people are actually given um, a chance to write in people, specific people, known donees or do no, known, not donors, but known uh, recipients of yeah. the eggs. You can donate to research or science. And a lot of women study really like that. I feel like it was cool. I was donating to science. But we, we have to ask a question, are all those eggs needed for science? Yeah. That's a big question. You know, or just dispose of the eggs. And it, the cutoff point I learned in the U.S. is roughly the age of menopause. Women are allowed to keep their eggs on ice until 50, 51, 52. It's sort of buried. But at that point, you have to make a decision, like where are they going to go? And a lot of women, I actually interviewed a lot of women in humanitarian organizations and in the U.S. military who worry about death before their eggs are disposed of. And they were signing over those rights to their parents. Or that was a very interesting thing that I learned. People who work in risky places, okay? So that is very important. Um, healthcare, you said, why are women in healthcare and tech maybe the top users of egg freezing? Again, I, I don't know, but I do think that women in healthcare were a little more knowledgeable about it. They were sort of the first adopters. It's like, oh, there's this new technology. I'm a physician. I'm going to do it. And women in tech are techie. You know, <laughs> they're like, oh, we've got a new tech. Our yeah. company is <laughs> paying for it. Yeah. And a lot of women told me, I wish I worked for Google. Do you think I wanted to spend $28,000 yeah. on two rounds of egg freezing? Anybody wish, would wish that their, com their company would pay for it. So there was a lot of, you know, griping. With women saying it was such a form of discrimination against single women. Why? Because in tech or in Fortune 500 com companies that give fertility benefits, they give them to married women who can prove that they have had at least one year of unprotected sexual intercourse and have not gotten pregnant. Oh, it's about oh, a penis oh, and, oh, yeah. and impregnating them. And so women said, it is so unfair. My colleague Colleen. She and her partner had sex for a year and a half, couldn't have a baby. So she gets four rounds of subsidized IVF from our company. That's the fertility benefits that married women get at our company. Why don't we? I am 37. I'm trying to prevent my own infertility. They saw egg freezing as a infertility prevention strategy. I want to do this. And I had to pay $16,000 for one cycle of egg freezing. I am so mad. And women thought that it also discriminated against gay women because gay women are not having one year of unprotected sexual intercourse with a man. So that was a, a lot of there. A lot of women felt it was very unjust. And so the reproductive justice issue, I want to bring that up. And I, so I, I'm glad you brought it up at the end, you know, access and funding and in access to technologies in America. We have a very powerful reproductive justice movement that has been forwarded by Black feminist scholars and activists. It's called the RJ Movement. And the definition that's been sort of agreed on is that reproductive justice is about the right not to have children, which has to do with abortion politics in America, the right to have children, and the right to parent children in safe, healthy, and dignified environments. And so for reproductive justice activists, um, including I had black women in my study who were very powerful spokespeople for egg freezing as a reproductive justice issue. It is a technology that should be available 
to minority women, women of color, to help in them in their right to have children. And it's especially important and somewhat painful because many, especially black women in America are the least likely to partner with a heterosexual man. It's something like more than 60% of heterosexual black women in America are unpartnered. And part of that is because the incarceration of one third of American black men will spend time in prison or jail, often for felonies, and it messes up their lives. They'll never be able to come out, hold a job, rent a house, you know? So there's it's such a disadvantage for that issue and, and policing and the Black Lives Matter, you know, movement is really focused on that. But also men of color in America are not as educated as women of color. And so for women of color who are highly educated and want to find an educated partner, their chances of finding somebody within their race are, are so much lower than say white women. So if they're you know, hitting these two you know, big problems. And so women were saying, we need the right to access increase and black women need to have the right to access. And so I, I do talk about minority issues and struggles a lot in the, in the book. And so black Latinx women were underrepresented in egg freezing in my study, and they are in general in America. I had no native or indigenous women in my study who volunteered. And the overrepresented groups were Jewish American women, as I've mentioned, and Asian American women. Asian Americans are 5.5% of America demographically, but they were 18.8% of my study. There were so many uh, Japanese American, Chinese American, Indian American uh, women in my study. And why, as I think I mentioned, Asian American women and Jewish American women are have among the highest levels of education in the country. So issues of justice and access, I think, are ones that are going to be ongoing issues when we're talking about increasing and its inaccessibility and its high cost. These are going to be enduring problems. I don't think they're going to be fixed very quickly. Um, and I think I, since you brought that up last, I think I'm going to end there. Thanks, Thank Thank you. you. Yeah. There's so many great comments, but I know that we only actually have five minutes oh, left for questions. So the room is just um, full of questions and radical educators in your mind. So, uh, questions from the room. Thank you so much. This is so interesting. Um, I have a question about the women in tech because I have a few friends who have told me about this. They work in that yeah. sector, and I've always thought it was a bit odd, but now I understand. Um, did you speak to any women who had actually taken up what was offered by the company they worked for? Do you think there's a big take-up? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. And I, I interviewed what I called egg freezing activists who pushed for those fertility yeah. benefits, first of all. So I have actually started one chapter with the story about those uh, women who really pushed. And she actually found a partner and got pregnant with her frozen eggs. So it was a good story for her. But yeah, so she really pushed. She felt it was just discriminatory against single women. And then I did talk to women in tech who had used the, the benefits. And you know, actually there was a woman, she was bisexual. She said, actually, I feel like I'm a lesbian, but she had dated men and women. And she said, you know, I'm 30. She was one of the youngest. I'm 30 years old. It's paid for by my company. I, I want to be, she had great plans for herself. She actually wanted to be an entrepreneur, a tech entrepreneur. And she said, the, the, the technology is here. It's being paid for. Now is good. You know, and so she did it. And so, yeah, there were women in tech who were so grateful that it was being paid for by, you know, big West Coast um, and women who weren't in tech saying, I wish I worked for Google, you know. So I think the fact that it, I don't think women were uh, felt, um, it was not, you know, they were very mad at all the rhetoric about, oh, the tech firms are pushing women to just work harder, harder, harder. They're, they were saying, me and my friends, this has nothing to do with it. We just happen to work in tech and we're grateful that it's paid for because we're in the situation we can't find a partner and we're, we're using that technology. So I think that rhetoric uh, was misconstrued. Yeah. yeah. But I think that as more and more companies pay for it, more and more women will use it. Yeah. In Australia, I guess, too. In Australia, too, some companies are paying for it. Yeah, I think one of my friends who works for Meta said. Yeah, Meta, Facebook, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. It's really interesting. I was just wondering, uh, did any of the women in the study consider adoption? Or was that like a question, like they were just interested in like, having biological children? Yeah, you know, I can, uh, um, women wanted to have families, right? You know, and I think that a lot of them, I'm going to say a lot of women wanted to feel the experience of pregnancy. And I think that's found around the world. They, 
They'd hoped always wanted to go through pregnancy, right? But it's not America, I'm going to say, as a pro adoption society in general. Um, you know, many people have adopted siblings. You know, it's not, I think America's pro adoption, adoption has become increasingly difficult, inaccessible, and expensive. And I'll tell you, a lot of the children in the foster care system, which is huge in America, are children of color. And there's a very strong feeling among um, the black social workers organization in America that um, children should be, if possible, reunited with biological family, relatives. Um, if that's not possible, that they should be placed in black families where parents will understand their particular situations. And so if you were a woman uh, or a couple interested in fostering or adopting from the foster system, it's, there are barriers to that. And single women, you know, if you wanted to adopt as a single woman or as a gay couple, there are additional barriers. Um, there's a great book, a poignant book by an anthropologist, Krista Craven, called Reproductive Losses, um, Obstacles, Challenges to Queer Family Making. Uh, it came out a couple of years ago, maybe like in 2018, and she herself was in a uh, same-sex relationship. They lost a pregnancy, and she talked to many people who had tried to adopt. I mean, that was their preference to create a family and, uh, you know, thought that they were at that moment that they were going to get the child from like a known, you know, a, you know, bio mom and it fell through. And it was a very heartbreaking book about the difficulties of adoption, especially for queer people or single people. So it's not easy. And overseas adoption, which used to be quite prevalent in America, has become so difficult and highly expensive. So it's not that people wouldn't consider it, it's just very difficult and expensive, sadly. And I don't know if that's true in Australia as well. Does anybody know uh, challenges to adoption here? I heard that adoption is very low. It's very hard, right? It's hard, yeah. So most adoption here, if you want to adopt, it has to be overseas, which means, um, and that's getting increased. Mm -hmm. Difficult, yeah, it's the same story for the US, yeah. I'm so sad to say that we've run out of time and we, 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 we try and end. But just to really reiterate that, I mean, it's, it was wonderful to hear you say, um, to speak about American society in this way. So I just wanted to end by saying, for me, how wonderful it was to read a really meticulous, detailed study that's very ethnographic in orientation and that is focusing on American society and offering what I think is a really compelling ripper lens into that society. Um, so thank you so much to everyone for joining us in the room and online. And I'm sure the discussion will continue as soon as we, as we model. And we really appreciate you coming to visit us on your visit to Australia. Oh. And I'm so grateful to Mira <laughs> yeah. for your always compelling and insightful comments. Oh, thank, thank you, so you Karina and Rakita and Mira. It was awesome. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you so much.